Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Martim. I'm from Instituto Moreira Salles in Brazil. I'll be the master of ceremonies in this session, which I guess qualifies me to introduce myself as MC Martim, a chance I will not let slip. So thanks for joining us today. We'll be having a talk about geospatial data and IIIF today. We invited, well, three other projects, considering I'm part of Imagine Real, uh, to talk about what we're doing with geographic information and IIIF resources. So the, the way we structured this session is we'll have uh, four 15-minute presentations with five-minute Q&A uh, sessions between them. Uh, I'd like to also remind that our session will be followed by the IIIF map session, where we'll be continuing a very much alike discussion. So for those who can attend, I strongly encourage you to stay tuned after this very session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the Builder der Schweiz online project, which I think will be presented by Thomas Hensley, but I am not positive on that. So um, BSO folks, whoever is there and wants to take over, please do. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the introduction. Very kind. Uh, thank you for having us. I shall start my screen share here. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? I hope so. Yeah. Thank you so much. So thank you for introducing us. Um, uh, thanks for having us, especially. And if I uh, mean us, I definitely do mean that I'm speaking here for an entire team. This is, first of all, Florian Kreutli, which is our knowledge graph engineer at uh, Saari. And then uh, he has done most of the part of the work and of the presentation. And uh, Stephanie Sanchi, she's our scientific um, coordinator at Saari and the Builder der Schweiz project. And my name is Thomas Hensley. I'm actually director and project leader at Saari and the only, only the one that presents what other people um, have been uh, developing. So thank you definitely for having us. So speaking of, I'm just trying to get my uh, thing work. Just one word or two words about Sari. Sari is uh, the Swiss art research infrastructure. It is a project by the University of Zurich. Co-partners are the ETA Zurich and the Swiss Institute for Art Research in Zurich. Uh, it is part of a national roadmap with a funny title, uh, Roadmap of Research Infrastructure of National Relevance. Uh, we are transitioning to the next phase right now. And its mission is actually to combine the scholar expertise of Swiss research institutions uh, and by research institutions I mean both academic and non-academic institutions such as the gla entire GLAM sector. Um, what you want to have is obviously mutual access to research resources, maybe data, maybe visual resources and that is based on a linked data network and obviously uh, IIIF. Um, that's one of the scheme that he depicted uh, uh, during proposal time with a funny green line uh, meaning the borders of Switzerland. Uh, this is obviously not what we stick to. We want to be working on an international level. Um, now for the project, a brief introduction. Uh, the project is called Bilder der Schweiz Online. Uh, I would translate it as Images of Switzerland. It is about depicting Switzerland's historical landscapes over space and time starting from 1700 until roughly 1950. It consists of all sorts of materials, prints, aquarels, sketches, photos and postcards. A core part of it is the so-called Schweizer Kleinmeister. Uh, these are actually 
Schweizer Kleinmeister, so-called minor masters, that would use mass printed uh, um, sketches that would be hand colored. So it's a kind of affordable way to, to bring home to your loved ones uh, impressions from Switzerland, as I call it, it's the postcard before the postcard. Um, we deal with images metadata from various large libraries, the Zentralbibliothek Zürich, the Swiss National Library, and uh, Stiftung uh, Familie Fehlmann, which is also happens to be the foundation which paid for the project. So um, to, to briefly give you an, an, an overview of the kind of materials, as I mentioned, we are having uh, photographs, we are having uh, prints, we are having sketches also, uh, we are having uh, colored prints as I was mentioning. So it's, it's a really a wide, uh, um, a wide range of materials that we do have. The, the goals of the projects could be phrased in uh, three layers. Uh, first is a technical one, so we want to semantically link images and metadata. Uh, according to IIIF and linked open data standards. Uh, for on a scholarly level, we want to explore and enrich existing knowledge uh, with research results. And on a didactic level, we want to make these findings available to the uh, public and also to public schools uh, to, of all ages actually to have a chance to discover this uh, richdom of materials. Well then, um, uh, the team, I will skip that. Uh, it's a twofold project, which has a more didactic part on the right side and more the, let's say, semantic part on the left side. Um, and I will go directly to the data pipeline. Um, so a brief overview of what our pipeline is, which actually uh, is quite important to understand how we link uh, IIIF data. So first of all, we have metadata from three different collections. It's the Central Bibliothek Zurich, which delivers us Mark 21 as Excel. It's the Swiss National Library, which delivers us a custom-made XML export. And we also have from a foundation uh, a custom Excel format. That has been uh, conversed and curated. Uh, what we do is obviously align with reference data for persons, places, and concepts. Um, we do a lot of data cleaning that needs to be said. They do have a very high standard, but still some data cleaning is actually uh, needed. Um, then, the, in this context, the more interesting part is the IIIF sources. Some of them we directly consume from a IIIF endpoint from the ERARA platform in Zurich. Others we use the wiki media platform, which is a, a custom API, as you might know, and uh, a very, very small part actually is uh, high resolution TIFFs that we get from the foundation Familie Fehlmann. Um, the pre-processing um, does actually cover quite a lot. It's aggregation of source data, aggregation of image data and curated data, and it's conversion. That's uh, actually an important part of free text dates into machine readable uh, formats. So, um, what comes next? What we do is the usual ETL pipeline. We do conversion of aggregated data into a Cytox CRM RDF format using the 3M platform that you see on the right side and uh, the X3ML uh, engine that produces us the kind of uh, um, graphs that you would see also on the right side. Uh, there is obviously also some um, post uh, conversion or post-processing um, uh, cleanup is being needed. We are harvesting additional data for uh, enti linked entities, especially when it comes to images, to locations, which makes the data uh, way better. The results that you get from there is actually a semantic research data published on a dedicated platform and available via standard linked open data interfaces. You see a, a glance of that on the right side. 
What you also get is enriched IIIF manifests for all images in the project, uh, whatever kind of sources that we have. Now, the focus that we have in this project, uh, and I'm finally addressing the common interest of this panel, uh, um, the geospatial aspects of our project, um, that has certain notions. So the premise is um, we do feel a difference between the geographic, the three-dimensional reality and the de depicted landscapes. That's not very much so in photographs, but it's very much in artistic interpretation of the landscape. So what we ask ourselves, which are the differences and why are the differences? The data that we need to analyze this is actually location markers and field of visions, so uh, angles if you want to so, and to uh, investigate in the distortion of geographic conditions in artistic representations. So this is um, our, our uh, research interest um, and kind of to, to investigate into the uh, truthfulness of the artistic representation. One specific case that we have are the so-called voyage pittoresque, um, which you see an example right here, uh, which are actually um, uh, printed uh, voyage, carnet de voyage, if you want. So very much in the tradition of the Grand Tour, where you would have a visual guide towards what you would see on your tour uh, across the Alps or inside Switzerland, whatever. And that's specifically interesting because uh, every now and then the same spots are getting uh, uh, depicted in these uh, uh, voyage picturesque. One example that we show you here is uh, actually not from Switzerland, it's actually from northern Italy, from uh, Lombardia. It's the Isola Bella in the, uh, around the Isole Borromei in the Lago Maggiore. He, here you see three or four uh, different uh, viewpoints of the same islands. You see in the on the map, on the cartographic representation, you see the angles, the viewpoints, how they are being made. And this is actually interesting to compare how this is being used for um, uh, for actually for representing one or the other uh, spot. So. Um, what are we doing? And um, we're actually uh, collaborating with our colleagues from Snapshot, which will uh, give a talk right after uh, this brief introduction. Uh, the goal of the platform Snapshot is actually um, to locate landscapes or depictions of landscapes at scale through uh, crowdsourced uh, monoplotting. Um, what you what you will see here, we are actually, this platform is able to um, to place or to locate aerial photographs of uh, uh, in, in actually a 3D model of the landscape. I will not go into the details because my colleague Jens is going to do that way better, obviously. And uh, what's interesting for us is to find out how well it works for artistic representation as opposed to photographic representation. Here you do see an, an example of a aerial photography. So these are the, obviously the challenges that we need to, to uh, meet. Now, how do we proceed? So first of all, we need to identify the suitable images. Um, we are actually creating a training set using a pigeon uh, to, to start with. Then we're doing uh, some training uh, via a ResNet uh, 34 model on Google Colab using PyTorch and fast AI. Uh, AI. Uh, and that actually leads us to a classifying of the images um, uh, locally on our machines and an output in CSV. And here you can obviously find out that not by way, by far, not all of the images are suitable for this geographic uh, location via uh, snapshots. So what we do generate if we have all the identified all the images we generate a, a CDOC CRM or RDF uh, based uh, knowledge graph uh, that can be interested and then actually these are, are being loaded via Sparkle query uh, obviously via the IIIF API and uh, in some cases for now via URL for downloads into the Smatro platform where we have a brief glance on the right side how we try or the system tries to locate these images 
on um, the on on that geographic representation. How this? Sorry, I was jumping. How this looks like? You have a. Um, I think this is actually a, a bit of a mock-up. I'm not sure if these are real data. Here you can see the overlay of the actual artwork with the the reality of the landscape, which, well, reality in terms of three-dimensional uh, representation of the landscape, where you can blend in, mix, and, and adjust points that you can, points of reference that you can identify and actually uh, locate or place this artistic representation in the very landscape. And um, that was it from right now. I hope I'm uh, more or less on time. Um, I'm happy to accept questions. Uh, if there aren't any questions, I'm even more happy to uh, hand over to Jens. Thank you, Thomas. So I see one question here, but I don't think, yeah, I think it's incomplete. So let's just wait, see if anyone has any questions. Just remembering we have five minutes in between presentations to answer questions and then we can have an extended discussion in the next session for those who can attend. So no questions so far. Alexander, I see your question here, but there's only one word in it. So if you hit enter without wanting to, maybe you want to place it again, or else we can proceed to the next presentation by snapshot. Oh, in the chat. Okay, sorry. So Ronald Haynes asks, were there any artistic trends in these early photographs? Uh, thank you, actually. That's that's not just a uh, very interesting question. Um, there were definitely artistic trends. Um, as you may know, early Switzerland has kind of been discovered by the British and they had a specific interest in, in nature. So they would every now and then they would follow the same path or visit the same mountains, which were uh, from just an iconic uh, viewpoint interest they were very interesting or just from from history from storytelling so they would essentially follow this kind of of trends and obvi obviously there is a, a certain sense of of dramatizing uh, especially when it comes to meteorologic conditions you would never see the blue sky postcard thing you would always see clouds so to bring some depth into into these depictions so there is clearly a um there are trends, so there is a kind of a style that you could could um, extract from that, uh, which will change, obviously, and I guess that's the point of your questions, which will change over the years, so the t over time. Thank you. We actually have quite a few um, questions coming in. Matthias asks, do you classify the accurate, sorry, the accurate paintings versus the artistic mountains. Uh, that's actually what we what we try to identify the 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 artistic representation uh, against the actual mountains, but that's not always quite easy because sometimes it ever it, it depends more on the available viewpoints than on something that would be like like a, a, a neutral orthographic representation. Okay. I think we could move on. There's there's actually more questions that if we have time at the end, we can address. Uh, sure. Just real, 
really quick, Tracy Seneca asks, is the reality view of the landscape only modern or is it linked to date? I, I know I can answer that, that for Switzerland, it is only modern. So it is a, a current model, a 3D model they have. However, uh, spoiler alert, in the Imagine Rio and Snapshot integration, we do have temporarily accurate um, models. So keep your, 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 your questions coming, please. And I'll, I'll hand the word to Jens Ingensen so he can present Snapshot. Thank you, Jens. Thank you, Martin. Um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Your your audio is really low for me. Really? Not sure if, if for, for everyone, but you might want to bring your mic uh, I will up. Closer. I have it better now. Is that okay? I still can't hear you, but it might be me. So people in the chat, do you hear Jens? It's, it's quite low quite indeed. For me also, yeah. Okay. I, I will just talk a little bit louder. I, I hope that this, this works. Okay. Um, so uh, I will present Smapshot. So uh, my name is Jens Ingensand. I'm professor at the University of Applied Sciences, uh, Western Switzerland. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, uh, Jens, we, we still can't hear you. If you, if you click here on, on the mic and then audio settings, you can uh, bring your your gain up. Sorry, I will just so stop sharing. Um, sorry about that. So on the mic that says mute, uh, we click the arrow and then microphone input level. Okay, is it better now? Uh, please tell me if it's better. Uh, it's still pretty low. You might want to, to bump it all the way. Okay. Okay, is it better now? Can you, can you just tell me if it's, if it's good now? No. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's still it's pretty low. Still pretty low. Oh, okay. It, now, now, now it's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now it's good. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I will share my screen once again. Um, okay. So here we go. So I'm I'm Jens Ingensand. I'm a professor at the University of Applied Sciences, Western Switzerland. And I will present the uh, Smapshot project. So first, um, we're uh, at the, the University of Applied Sciences. Where we are two institutes working with this project. We are uh, the Territorial in uh, Engineering Institute, INSIT, and the Media Engineering Institute, M MEI, who are, who are working on this project. And this, uh, this project has, uh, has uh, started in 2016. And the basic idea behind this project is that uh, we have uh, photos, images, paintings in, in archives. And uh, yeah. And um, images are not geo referenced and are often not properly uh, tagged. So met metadata is missing. And on the other hand, we have the general public with distributed knowledge about places, about time, about things that have happened in, in time. So the Smapshot platform is, bridges the gap between the general public and the archives. Um, so the idea of Smapshot is that uh, the general public can georeference images and by doing uh, the georeferencing part, we can ex extract metadata for all of the pictures. We can, for instance, extract toponyms and uh, extract 
things that are visible in, in, in these images uh, automatically. And by doing this, we can, uh, on one hand, uh, visualize change, like change in landscape, uh, change in urbanization. And we can also generate data that is afterwards interesting to, to analyze for, for, for scientists. So for instance, climate change, if we have uh, on, on the left side, uh, a picture from, from 1900, and on the right side, we have a picture from, from today, uh, or, uh, or urbanization. It's also one, one picture from, from the 1960s, and on the right, it's, it's from today. Or uh, natural hazards, uh, what has happened in uh, maybe 1990 and how it looks today. Um, I will just give a brief presentation how Smapshot works, and then I will maybe try to, to do a, a, also a brief um, live uh, demonstration. So basically, you have a map on, on Smapshot with um, uh, photos um, that are uh, either already georeferenced or not georeferenced yet. And for pictures that are not georeferenced yet, we have an, uh, a priori, uh, an approximate uh, location of these uh, these pictures. So we each point here is, is a, an approximate location of a picture that has, for instance, been extracted from the metadata that's some, sometimes available for, for, for the uh, pictures. Um, and as a user, as a crowdsourcer, I can just put a, a pin on the map uh, to point out the, the approximate location from where the picture has been taken. Then on the next step, um, uh, yeah, I can, I can just zoom in a little bit more and uh, posi position it uh, even, uh, even, even better. And then I can uh, indicate the direction of the photograph, of the photograph, so the, uh, the, the, the direction of view. And once I have done that, uh, uh, a virtual globe will open. Then on the left side, you have the picture, uh, the historical picture, and on the right side, you have a virtual globe. The virtual globe, uh, everything here is, is, is a web platform. So the virtual globe is actually a 3D uh, terrain model. And then we have um, aerial imagery that is just displayed on top of this uh, 3D model. And once we have navigated at the, the approximate location where this picture has been taken, uh, I can simply uh, point out at least four points that are visible in the virtual globe and in the picture. So once I have pointed out four, um, four ground control points, um, we can compute the exact, exact location from where the picture has been taken plus the three angles, like the direction of view and uh, the tilt and, and the yaw um, uh, angles. And so we, we can, uh, uh, once we have done this, we can, we can display the, the photo on top of the, of, the, of the virtual globe. And we can then also play with the transparency or with the depth of, uh, of the photo. Um, up to now, we have about 180,000 uh, georeferenced uh, images in, uh, in Snapshot. Uh, we have different uh, collections in, in, in there. And um, we have uh, about 560 volunteers, crowdsourcers, who are doing all the work. One photo takes about seven, uh, one picture takes about seven minutes to, to georeference uh, on, on average. And we have um, yeah about 1,500 images a month that are georeferenced, and uh, so if you count <laughs> everything together, uh, we end up with uh, around two to 20,000 hours of work that the volunteers have been uh, doing uh, on on Snapshot. Um, we also have a very active uh, community, so there are some some people who are who are really spending a lot of time on, on, on Snapshot and doing the, the georeferencing. And this, this community, they also uh, meet each other uh, several times a year and, uh, and exchange ideas and, uh, and um, yeah, discuss, discuss the pictures. Um, I maybe just want to, to give you a, 
uh, want to try to, to, to give you a, 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 a little live demo about uh, about Smapshot. So this is the uh, the URL uh, the, the, of the Smap, of the of the platform Smapshot dot uh, 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 vd dot ch. And here on this platform, we we can see. Uh, uh, all the pictures that have been georeferenced uh, up to now. So each each blue dot is a, is a picture. And we can also see um, for all of the pictures, when I mouse over on, on, the, on the pictures, the um, the footprint of, of the of the image. And if you have we since we have the, the position from where the picture has been taken, uh, we can calculate using a 3D uh, terrain model the uh, the exact footprint. So the, the the area that is visible in one picture. And since we have that, we can uh, afterwards also uh, calculate uh, toponyms, so, so place names uh, based on, on this footprint. Um, I can see that my colleague Nicolas Blanc. Uh, yes. Who's, who's, yes. Sorry, uh, I think we're seeing the, still the, the other uh, tab. Not oh, sure if sorry. You, if you share the, the whole, whole screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you, Martin, for, for reminding me. So I'm up to yeah, now, now. I haven't. Yeah, now we see it. Yeah, I, I was just mouse overing on, on, on the map. Uh, and here you can see uh, the blue dots that are uh, uh, representing uh, uh, pictures. And we can also see the footprint that has been calculated for each uh, picture. And once we have this, this footprint, we can, uh, yeah, my colleague uh, Nicolas, who's also. Uh, 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 here with us to, to tonight, he has uh, calculated. Uh, he has created an algorithm which will calculate uh, exactly what is visible on, on, on a picture. And this is not very easy to do since, since there are some things that are very far and maybe less important. That there are things that are uh, much closer uh, and maybe more important. And to to uh, to decide what to what to. Uh, uh, take into account and what not to take into account is this is uh, something that is not very easy to do. Um, so once I have uh, selected a picture, for, for instance, one from uh, Zermatt, for, for instance, showing the, the, the famous Matterhorn, I'm uh, just trying to, uh, yeah, maybe this one. Um, so once I, I have uh, clicked on, on, a, on a photo, the historical uh, photo will, will, will load. And then uh, in the background, we have um, uh, the 3D terrain model, so the digital globe that, that is loading. Uh, and we can then uh, pl uh, play with transparency. We can, we can check uh, how landscape has, uh, has changed since then. And we can also play with the depth of, uh, of the picture and, uh, and also compare how landscape has changed. So yeah, here you can see, for instance, the, the glacier that has melt. Uh, well, the, uh, the last years. Um, and yeah, this photo here is for, for instance, is for, from 1990. Um, I will try to continue my presentation. So, so this is this is basically where you have one uh, mode where you can discover all the pictures that have been uh, georeferenced and contribute where you can select the picture and then uh, do the georeferencing uh, yourself. Um, I will try to share uh, my uh, presentation again. Uh, uh, share screen. Um, one second. Okay. Um, yeah. I hope you can see my uh, presentation again. Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, Triple IF and, uh, and Smapshot. So uh, at the moment we are using uh, Triple IF um, collection manifests uh, for the first import of, of a new collection. So we can connect directly to a Triple IF uh, server and do the, the first import. And once we have done this, we are using uh, the Triple IF image API and uh, image tiling API uh, for displaying the photo in, 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 in Smapshot. So we, we can directly connect to a triple IF server and display all the uh, all the contents directly in in, in Smapshot. And uh, yeah, th three recent uh, collections are actually using this uh, recent triple uh, IF uh, 
uh, workflow, for instance, uh, the Image and Rear project, which will be uh, presented right afterwards. Um, one thing that we would love to see uh, uh, in IIIF uh, uh, are geospatial cap uh, capabilities. So for instance, uh, uh, to extract all the photos within a, a specific area so that we give, uh, for instance, a bounding box or a specific area that, um, that, uh, uh, for which we want to extract uh, pictures. Um, one uh, another point which which you, what we also would love love to see is uh, standardization of geographic metadata. So, for instance, the footprint or the the coordinates of the fo photographer. And um, we also see some some possible ways. Uh, uh, well, the, the idea is not to to reinvent the wheel, but but there are already some existing standards. For instance, from the OGC, uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, that that are existing that could for instance, be, be integrated or um, or at least taken taken into account, for instance, the OGC Geopose uh, 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 specification, uh, which is which is very interesting in uh, in this uh, in this context. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I, I managed to uh, to stick with the, the time slot that, that I had. Um, thank you very much for for listening. And uh, yeah, if you have questions, I'm I'm here to to answer them. Thank you very much, Jens. So if anyone has questions for a snapshot, now is the time. Please use the Q&A tab instead of the chat so we can concentrate them and hopefully answer in the end if we don't have time now for it. Just wait one more minute, see if anything pops up. Otherwise we can proceed and then come back to them. overall positive reactions to this map shot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can you say a bit more about the crowdsourcing and what number of volunteers continued over time? That's from Ronald Haynes. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much for, for the question. Um, yeah, I can, I can say two, three words about, about crowdsourcing. Uh, when we started the project in 2016, the, well, there were no crowdsources. And uh, we, we started uh, with some, there were some articles in the newspapers and uh, it slowly started. But, but when it really, um, uh, yeah, uh, got bigger and bigger was when, when we integrated the collections from, from the uh, ETH, so the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in uh, in uh, in Zurich, that already had a community, an existing community. They were mostly inter interacting uh, by by email, so commenting on on, on photos and, and so on. And then when they were integrated in Snapshot, it just exploded uh, in, in, in terms of in terms of crowdsourcing. Um, something that is maybe interesting with the with the community is that uh, most people, uh, most volunteers are. 60 plus uh, uh, are male and um, are most of them are quite interested in interested in in in, in technology so most most of them are, are retired engineers actually okay thank you to keep the the things on schedule i'm gonna go ahead and start our presentation because we still have two other projects to present and then at the end we can answer any other questions so Dave, if you could share your screen, because me and David Hyman will be doing a joint presentation on Imagine Real. Okay, so um, I'll present Imagine Real, but more specifically the situated views of Rio de Janeiro, which is a project funded by the Getty Foundation and it consists on a collaboration between Imagine Rio, which you'll see in the next, you can, you can skip it. So Imagine Rio is a platform created by humanities professors at Rice University, um, sorry. And um, which is basically a historical Google Maps, as I like to call it from Rio, where you can pick a year and you render a map of Rio at that time with any polygons of buildings that they could um, find. And it was, it was made by digitizing historical cartography 
uh, into a geographic database. So uh, we from Instituto Moreira Salles, from the next slide, please. Uh, we are a cultural institution based in Rio, well, in Brazil, really. Uh, and we hold a, a large collection of historical photography. We started collaborating back in 2015. And since then, we had a chance to, oops. Uh, we had a chance to, to write this proposal to the Getty Foundation, which was approved in late, late uh, 2018, where we started our project, which is called Situated Views. So um, if, uh, whose outcomes are as follows. So Dave, please, yeah. Uh, the main goal is to, to have 4,000 photographs from our uh, collection IMS published in Imagine Real, so we have to geolocate them. And by, by demand of the Getty, we are also only working with, uh, open, with public domain images, so everything needs to be published under uh, open license. Uh, more specifically about this project, uh, next please, is um, two of the goals of the project are to have FFF manifest for all the objects we published and also have Imagine Real be FFF compliant so we can ingest FFF content from other institutions. Uh, I'll talk, uh, as you can see, uh, besides from that, we are integrating with Snapshot, so we're making a collection of our images available there for uh, geolocation. Uh, we are publishing all of our code in GitHub as open source, and we are also mirroring our data in Wikidata, which I'll show in a bit. So first of all, the, the geolocating process, uh, we are using Google Earth. As you can see, it has this photo overlay tool, which allows you to place an image on top of the 3D model. And then you can... Uh, use the, the controls and, and, and we use a 3D mouse to, to, to fly to the location and adjust the image to the background. And this gives us uh, geographic information such as latitude, longitude, altitude, heading, and even field of view and stuff like that. So uh, in the next slide, you can see the result of a geolocated image with this process. So you can get quite accurate positions using this method. Uh, you can see in the next one, even for street view photos or for uh, yeah, ground level, uh, if the building is still there, you can, you can get a, a really nice level of precision, even the, the windows lining up and everything. So this is, is pretty, it gives us pretty good data to work with. Um, so this uh, gives us a KML file in the next, um, as you can see, uh, which are saved and then processed. You can see it has all the information there and we process them to generate these view cones um, that are used to, to display the image in Imagine Real itself. Um, if you, if, yeah, okay. And this is a much, uh, so Imagine Real at start, the first images that were placed there were geolocated by hand which uh, didn't give us really an accurate result. So it was a uh, very subjective of the decision of where the camera was standing and the field of view and all of that. And with Google Earth, we have a uh, really, really um, accurate data coming from this, from this methodology. Now, um, going forward, uh, we are also mirroring all of our data in Wikidata. So we generate this um, quick statement CSV with our data that gets ingested into Wikidata and all of the images that we are publishing in Imagine Real are also being sent to Wikimedia Commons. So it's uh, another way of getting the, the high resolution and open license uh, objects that we are making available. Uh, of course, Publishing all of these in Wikidata gives us graphs like uh, the next slide, where you can make um, all sorts of investigations regarding the, the images, what they depict, but also about who made them and, and the general context, context of, of all of these images. So next slide, here is an overly simplified flow chart uh, depicting the, the path our data pursues. 
So from Google Earth, we generate the KMLs. From our digital asset management system, we export a XML with all the metadata for the images. Then we run all this in a ETL pipeline, which we are using Dexter for, which is a new Python, not new, but well, a Python framework for, for data management. And then this gets fed into Wikidata, also generates GeoJSON that uh, feeds the ArcGIS, which is the geographic database. And we also ingest the data into our Omeka, which is our triple F compliant repository. As of now, we are using a CSV, but the plan is to eventually fully automate this process by ingesting content in Omeka using its API. So once all of this gets to ArcGIS and Omeka, the real ordeal uh, begins and I'll let Dave take on from here with his much more complex flowchart. Thank you. Hi everyone, sorry about that. I needed to stop screen sharing to unmute myself. Um, my name is David Hyman. I'm technical lead at Access Maps and developer on the Imagine Rio program. Uh, everything that I'm gonna talk about today is visible at next.imaginerio.org. Uh, however, it's a very early beta, so please be kind. Um, the first thing I'm gonna walk you through is the Imagine Rio microservices architecture. Uh, and this is kind of how we combine the image data and geographic data that make up Imagine Rio, uh, and also where IIIF fits into that. So this diagram represents the entire Imagine Rio technical universe. Uh, it moves from private on the left side, uh, then to public on the right. Um, so starting in the private realm is the, the researchers, the, the actual people who do the work collecting the data. Uh, on the image side, that's at uh, IMS down in Rio. And then on the geographic side, that's at Rice University in Houston. Um, so our image data is collected and put into Omeka S. And Omeka S is this kind of big rectangle. And that represents Omeka S plus all of the, uh, all of the plugin architecture that, uh, that, that, that enables all of the functionality on Omeka. Uh, and that's containerized and running in a Docker image. So all of the image is stored in the Omeka S database, and that's the source of truth for our image data. Uh, that is where we store the final uh, image metadata that's referenced by the rest of the system. That image metadata then goes to the IIIF server, which creates the manifests. Uh, it goes to the image server, which uh, creates the image tiles and processes the images that the rest of the application uses. Uh, and then for the metadata attributes that don't fit within the manifest, those we access via the Omeka REST API. And now all of that gets bundled together and put into this triple I Rio or Imagine Rio search database. And that's our ephemeral database. So it's not a source of truth. It's just this database that we, uh, that we create and destroy and create and destroy and update based on the data that's being fed to it from other places. But that then gives us a highly optimized method for feeding the front end applications on the public side. Now, walking through the geospatial track, just to get ourselves caught up, uh, at the bottom there in the private realm, you can see that the, the researchers feed uh, temporally accurate, spatially accurate geographic data into a ArcGIS Pro Geo database. That's then fed through the, the GeoRio spatial API, which then also goes into the IIII Rio search. And now all of these together feed our front end applications, both the image viewer and the, the map Rio, the, the, the geospatial viewer. And then both of those are built uh, using Next.js static site rendering. Then finally, in the external layer, we have Wikidata context being brought in. And then we also have a, an S3 CloudFront CDN where we store our, our vector tiles. So let me go into each one of these in a bit more, a bit more detail, a bit more detail, if that's possible. Um, so first is the uh, headless Omeka S, uh, and that's our containerized metadata storage and IIIF image server. And why headless? 
uh, headless because we're only using it as a way for the researchers to store and generate and manage the image metadata. Um, the, the front end provided by Omeka is completely hidden from the public. For that, we use our own custom uh, Next.js image components. Now, the other thing we're using Omeka for is the IIIF image server. Uh, so when we create, when we make these requests for the images to be processed and tiled, uh, that goes through Omeka as well. I spoke briefly about this imaginary of search database, and that's our optimized API. Because while IIIF manifests are, are great and, and we, we love having the, the standards compliant, uh, unfortunately, they are a bit heavy for a lot of the operations we want to do. So instead of serving those manifests directly to our front end application, we run them through this ephemeral database. And that database keeps in sync with our sources of truth for image data and spatial data, and then serves a much more optimized, smaller front end uh, or smaller JSON package that's then delivered to, to our front end. It also enables the spatial searching and the temporal searching that are so important to Imagine Rio. Now, I just wanted to quickly walk you through the front end applications. Uh, first is the image viewer. And this image viewer is designed for, for speed. Um, it's built in Next.js using static site rendering. So all of the image metadata is, is rendered at first and packaged together and delivered on the site. So searching and filtering and, uh, and browsing uh, are really, really fast. When we move into the single image view, like you're seeing here, we have the mirror door image viewer, which enables that deep zooming plus the metadata. And this is fed directly from the manifest from the Omeka S server. Uh, plus we have the full metadata display that you can see down here below. The imagined real map, which is temporary accurate and set to the dates of the image, as well as the view cone showing exactly what the, the image depicts. And then a little further down, but unfortunately we don't go to it, is the 3D view uh, provided by Snapshot. Now in the Imagine Rio map, this is where we take all of our images and combine them with the geospatial data in a temporally enabled environment. Um, so first of all, you can see the timeline. We use vector tiles and um, well, first Mapbox GL, now MapLibre to render the, uh, to render the base map. That enables that very smooth animation because all of the data for all of the years from 1500 to 2021 uh, is loaded at once. So as we animate, we can move through it very, very quickly. The base map itself is also used as dynamic styling. So it's, it's responsive, it's expressive. It, it responds to what the user wants. So uh, you can hide layers. You can click on a layer in the legend uh, and reveal exactly what's in that subtype to kind of show these uh, historic patterns in the geospatial data. Uh, and then finally, and this is kind of the, the, the real big advancement between uh, Imagine Rio 2 and this Imagine Rio Next is that side-by-side -side image display that allows you to deep zoom using the mirror door image uh, on one side, kind of viewing the image as an image, but then also viewing it in its geographic and temporal context on the right. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today is our IIIF enabled integrations and extensions, or as Martine likes to call them, uh, side quests. Uh, first off is the snapshot integration. So we have, using the IIIF manifest, brought uh, our series of views, a selected series of views, into snapshot. Uh, they load it directly from our, uh, from our database, but then also use our uh, temporally accurate base map tiles and our uh, temporally accurate DEMs, because not only is the urban fabric of Rio changing, the actual physical uh, the physical environment of Rio changes over time. And this enables the, the crowdsourcing users to geolocate um, in the most temporally accurate and spatially accurate way possible. We'll then take those view cones from Snapshot and load them back, sorry, view sheds from Snapshot and load them back into Imagine Rio, increasing the accuracy of our, of our view cones. Another extension of the Imagine Rio project was for the Venice Biennial, the Venice Architectural Biennial, uh, first in 2020, uh, now in 2021. Uh, so if you are in Venice, go have a look, uh, called How Will We Live Together? Um, and what was originally supposed to be a touchscreen display um, powered by static IIIF manifests and static map tiles 
um, was unfortunately spoiled by the pandemic. Uh, you can't touch things in public anymore. Um, so instead we're using a leap motion controller. And I don't know if you can see on the screen, but that's actually my hand moving around. Not now, when I, when I recorded the screencast. There's a sensor that records the position of my hand and motions like this winds the clock forward and winds the clock back. And you can point to images and tap on the map. Uh, and, and this was a really exciting exercise, uh, not just in kind of bringing our, bringing something that's, that's usually done in, in a laptop to an exhibition space, but also adjusting to the, the new reality of, of the pandemic and, and how we can still create rich interactive presentations, um, but in a, in a more socially distanced way. Uh, the final extension that, that I'd like to show you is the Imagine Rio narratives. Uh, and that's at narratives.imaginerio.org if you'd like to have a look. Um, and these are scrolling presentations of narrative data that allow researchers and, um, and, and um, residents of Rio to tell their own story using Imagine Rio data. And that's done in a kind of PowerPoint-like interface. So we've taken something that's complex uh, like narrative maps and, and um, added the power of Imagine Rio data, but democratized the approach and, and created an interface to, to create them, which, which I hope is as simple as PowerPoint. And we're hoping to use Imagine Rio as a, as a platform to allow a lot of people who haven't had access to these tools and give them the ability to tell stories about the development of Rio and share those stories in a way that, that hasn't been possible before. Uh, so thank you all for your time. And um, yeah, thank you, Martine. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, David. Um, feel free to shoot us uh, an email in these addresses. You can also check our newly created social media profiles at Imagine Real Underline. And uh, let's see any questions. What is the name of the touchless interaction implementation used for Imagine Real? So that's the leap motion sensor. And it's, a, it's like a MIDI controller that captures your, your hand movements, your finger position, so you can do all sorts of controlling with it. We're using it to, to navigate the map and select images. And it's currently on view at the Venice Biennale. If anyone is there or nearby, make sure you stop by. So any other questions? We still have a few that are directed to our past presenters that we can probably come back. But if not, I'll go ahead and invite people from 12 Sunsets to present. Please come forward. The 12 Sunsets representatives Hello. Hi, uh, my Hi. name is Ian, Ian Schisler. I think we were confused about the format, so we made that video, um, but we don't have a presentation uh, in this format. Do you want to show the video? Oh, okay. I think the video was 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 asked by the IIIF Maps group. Is that the the rapid fire video you you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, that's aimed at the next session. Um, but if you want to screen it now, sure. Uh, Is that you can also it probably give us some, uh, uh, some background, some context on the project. Um, sure. But yeah, absolutely. Feel free to, to, to screen it now if you want. Sure. Or um, I could talk briefly to kind of add some detail. And then maybe I'll switch with uh, Adam Heath and he can show the video. And he also has the tool up and ready to show. But we just don't have a uh, PowerPoint type. No, that's uh, fine. OK, great. Um, you want to share well, your screen and, and, and show 12 Sunset? I mean, it's up to you now. 
Yeah, let me, um, I'll speak and then I'll switch with Adam Heath and he can show his uh, screen. So the, um, we were working with Stace Maples from Stanford and he had first contacted me about a large collection that the Getty had of images of Los Angeles that were done over a period of decades by the artist Ed Ruscha. And um, they were looking for a way to geolocate those photos. And so Stace knew that at Brain Food we kind of tinker and that um, they had tried various automated approaches to achieve it and were having difficulty with it. And I also did some work on the, on the photo set, tried using structure from motion and also Hugen, if you're familiar with the um, panorama stitching software. So you can actually kind of trick it into doing linear um, photo stitching if you just make the photosphere super enormous because then basically it becomes a line. And um, that worked sometimes, but a lot of the photos are quite old and have a lot of film grain. And um, it just, the landmark detection they were too infrequently taken to where the parallax was so severe that you couldn't really get good landmark alignment in a lot of the images. So um, that gives a little background. The, the scheme that we finally came up with was to sort of take like a string of pearls approach where um, we would drag, you, you could find landmarks in like if you have a stream of photos and drag them to intersections and pin them and then interpolate the, uh, the intervening photos. So um, I guess I'll flip to Adam and he can show the video and then also show the tool and answer any questions that you might have there. So we're kind of winging it here. <laughs> so um, Adam, are you, uh, are you still with us? I'm online. Okay. I'm online. I'm online. So I'm going to stop my video and let you let it rip. Oh, hello. This is the app Ian was talking about. And I briefly want to showcase or show one of the place marker things he was discussing. I'm going to zoom back out. And this is Los Angeles County and all the images that we have placed. And what's interesting when these images finally get aligned, you can look in the actual image here. And if you see this blue line, that's a drainage ditch of some kind. And the image that's right in front of that, you can see this little drain coming off the road. That's the kind of human assisted image placement that we ended up having to make use of to get this app put together. So I'm gonna play the video and then open the floor for discussion. Can everybody see this video? We, we can, yeah, yeah, we can see it. Thank you. This is the Salmon Design Twelve Sunset presentation that showcases a subset 65,000 of images from the Andrew Shea's Streets of Los Angeles archive at the gate. If you wonder how the images were positioned on the map, Brain Food wrote a tool to position 173,000 images that were organized with the IIIF presentation API. First, we exclude images that have no bearing on routing, then we look for an identifiable place marker, in this case, a street address. One of the complexities with this archive was the variableness of the camera and film quality, in addition to no autofocus. For this triple IF range, we got lucky with a matching address early on. With that address, we can now drag the nearby images to the correct location and begin the process of placing additional images for proper interpolation. This project utilized triple IF collections as a grouping mechanism, triple IF image API for high res zooming and leaflets for both map placement and imaging. On the back end, PostgreSQL with PostGIS was used for basic geospatial algorithms, while PGRouting with the Tiger Road Edges dataset for routing. The tax property outlines are provided by the Lariac data feed. 
We attempted to use Puget as structured from motion initially, but the inbound image data was too noisy for that to work. So then we pivoted to the humanized placement of identifiable images and then interpolating the remaining canvas points. With enough images placed, a choroplast can be used to show the very building coverage in the region. The range from red to green visually represents increasing coverage of the IIIF range. You can plainly see the Sunset Boulevard route that is showcased on the 12 Sunsets presentation project. To create the bulk every building on the Sunset Strip, the original film rolls were cut into smaller segments and photographs. Along the way, the order of these strips got reversed, but the auto routing was able to deal with this scenario. After many ranges had been placed, we started to see a few that took a turn on the side road. Our best guess as to why this particular route change occurred is that it was lunchtime or there was some other sort of break required by the driving people. The coral cliff on the map is not just for display. Each GeoJSON outline of a Lariac building is clickable. The system immediately knows which ranges had a canvas that intersected with that building and allows us to drill back down into the matching range. Up in the hills, placement was a little hard. There was a dearth of available place markers. We ended up having to maybe find an intersection, then just looking at driveways or other breaks in the vegetation. Often there is no place marker data at all. While the 12 sunset site shows a single route, the full scope of the archive contains many more interesting details on other locations throughout Los Angeles County. Thank you for your time. So, interesting bits that were learned during this project. This is. <laughs> I'm getting some feedback. Sounds like somebody's outside. Oh, sorry. I hate YouTube. Sorry about that. Um, this is my first project using PG routing. So I had to learn that on the fly. Uh, my first real leaflet application, uh, which dealt with the GeoJSON of the buildings. The Stace helped quite a bit, Stace Maples of Stanford, teaching this new programmer how to deal with all the GIS information. The images did not get fully placed. A couple got excluded because of bad input data. There was several times where they just cut the strips up and just threw all the frames into a box randomly. And there's not really a whole lot that humans or computers can do with that. Are there any questions that people might have? And I guess just to elaborate on the routing, um, when we took on the contract, it was originally Sunset Strip, was that these were photos of Sunset Strip. And it was actually as we got into the archives that we discovered, like, oh, it's taking a turn. <laughs> and um, so the, uh, the PG routing implementation was actually rather hurried, just a, a few weeks. But it, uh, it, it worked as advertised. Thank you, Adam and Ian. Uh, I think we still have um, 15 more minutes on this session. So we are welcoming any questions for the 12 Sunsets project. And we also have a few in the backlog. So I'll give, I'll actually start with the, with the backlog and people can ask about 12 Sunsets on the go. So, I'll do it like 
in order presentations. To, to the BSO folks, uh, Rebecca is asking, how do you position art that isn't accurately placed? I.e. where you're not sure where it is positioned exactly. I'm glad you asked. Thank you for the question. So this is obviously a delicate thing because every now and then if you have uh, composed artworks which would just depict a group of mountains, they would obviously, that's what artists do, they would put every single mountain in the most favorable uh, light or angle, so to say. So we have technically don't think that we have a solution for that right now, but I would assume that we would eventually uh, uh, cut the entire artwork, well, the, well, the digital representation of it into pieces and identify the individual viewpoints and then work with a multiple uh, set of viewpoints. That's the only, um, <clears throat> so to say, that's the only viable solution I have from now. But probably Jens has already looked into that and has a better answer than I do. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I have a better answer. Uh, um, yeah, we, we have we have tried to, uh, or we, we did do reference some, some, some pictures and, um, and, uh, and, and and yeah, we discovered that that it's absolutely uh, that this is something that absolutely happens. That uh, the uh, the painter has actually uh, started painting a landscape and then probably moved in and in order to to make the landscape even more dramatic and, and has, uh, has, mm -hmm. uh, has, uh, has continued the, the painting from another viewpoint. So it, it's not possible to to find the spot from from where the picture has been painted. So yeah, I think that this is one possible solution that the, that the picture is simply cut in pieces and uh, uh, you referenced piecewise. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, to add to that, we actually have uh, uh, watercolors and paintings in Imagine View as well. And we were actually able with the, with the Google Earth approach to identify those who are who, who are made with uh, optical apparatus since they, they behave as photographs. So that's uh, an interesting touch because uh, of course, when they are made on top of a, of a ground glass with some kind of, of optical or, or lens device, the, the outline matches the terrain perfectly. So they behave as photographs and can therefore be georeferenced as photographs. And, and, this, and this allows us to even identify that, that aspect of, the, of their inception using um, the, the methods we use. So thank you, Rebecca, for your question. Now, there are quite a few people wanting to ingest their content into Snapshot. Um, so Ben is asking, how can I suggest our own collections for inclusion or if he can host his own Snapshot? Mm -hmm. And then, oh, Thomas just copied the Andy, uh, Andy's question that is, any plans to open up to other collections outside Switzerland? We have a huge collection of UK aerial photography over a number of decades. Well, for that, I can say that we have real images in mm -hmm. snapshots, so I think mm -hmm. they're open to, to collections outside Switzerland, but I'll leave them to them to answer. Yeah, th thank you very much for, for, for these, uh, these questions. So uh, maybe the, the, the first question, uh, is it possible to host our own own snapshot? Yeah, basically yes. Uh, most of the code of uh, snapshot is open source uh, and based on, on open source uh, uh, JavaScript libraries such as uh, uh, Cesium and uh, Vue.js, and, and, and uh, you're also using uh, uh, Post, Post .js, um as, uh, as, the, as the last project. Um, uh, about the, the hosting, yes, it's it's absolutely possible to, to host uh, collections outside uh, from from Switzerland. Um, uh, one one thing that that we we need, uh, of course, is not only the, uh, the the photos, but also a, a digital terrain model. And something that was very very particular also for for Rio uh, was that um, the terrain changed over time. So we were uh, we we had to include uh, the terrain that fit the uh, the period of time when a picture had been taken. So basically, we need a, a digital terrain model. We need 
something to cover the, the digital terrain model with, such as aerial uh, photographs and, and so on. And uh, then of course the, uh, the, 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 the pictures. So yeah, it's, it's possible. Uh, maybe ju just one thing that I, I, I would like to, to add is that once we have hosted the pictures, there's also someone who needs to validate the, the, the picture locations. So, so this is also one task that, uh, that needs to be done in order to, uh, yeah, to validate all the locations and put the, um, the photos online. Thank you, Jens. Um, for the 12 Sunsets project, Ben is asking, how much work on the code for the 12 Sunsets project will be needed to reuse it in other projects? How generic is it? I am really impressed anyway. That's a good question. The original contract wasn't to make a reusable tool. It was just something BrainFood used internally to get the images placed. That being said, the data structures are generic and we read the uh, presentation data, the collection manifest range data directly and pull it into our little Postgres database. So it could be done, it could be reused. It would need to have some work, additional work done so that there's different classifications of collections so that a person owns a collection or a group owns a collection and you can keep them all separate. And it needs a better uh, user model too for protection of various assets. So right now the answer is no, it's not reusable. I mean, I think it could be reused pretty easily by people in the United States because it's tiger road data. But for instance, the, the building boundary outlines are, um, that's Lariac and LA specific data set, but it's, I guess, one thing to note about it, it is 100% open source. And Adam and I are both Debian developers, so we are actually super open to open sourcing it or working with people to open source all of it if there's a, uh, an interest in that. And also, since the contract was to provide data, not code, it's, we, have, uh, we can definitely open source it. And the Getty is, I think, excited about that idea even. Thank you. Yeah, I would say the Getty would most likely like to have this open source based at least on our project with them. They're strong advocates of open licenses. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, I have a question for me and Dave that is uh, by David. I'd like to ask what kind of specific challenge you have anticipated in getting local audiences and web behaviors in order to, to be able to engage with the idea of telling geospatial stories in the Imagine Real project. Oh, there's one reply already. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to use Google. But anyway, we, we have a, a group of, of our beta testers that is a, a group of, of researchers, uh, mostly in, in Rio and Brazil, but also some from abroad. Who, were, who helped actually to, to, to design this tool. So they would come with, um, with feature, um, features they would like to have. And so basically as of now, they are the only ones who, who made any uh, narratives and uh, they help us to, to bring it to where it is right now. But we also are planning an outreach movement in October uh, with, the, with the Getty Foundation uh, the, this particular tool wasn't part of the project, but they're eager to, to, to make people aware of it. So I think we'll have, uh, and we're also working with press in Brazil. So I would say that starting from October, we might have some, quite a few people coming in and trying to do their own narratives. I think David might want to add something to this answer, Dave. Uh, well, no, I mean, that, that certainly covers it, but outreach is a big part of it. Um, getting people to think in terms of this new medium is, is a big challenge. Uh, even researchers, getting them to, to think about how to craft their stories in a way that fits in and, and lets the, the time and space drive the narrative was, was a big challenge. So as we move to, to bring this to, to other groups, uh, especially marginalized communities, uh, I think there will always have to be uh, funding in place 
to, uh, to, to provide for outreach. Yeah, and I don't know how we managed to do it, but we have five minutes left and one last question that is addressed to everyone. So I think we completely killed this presentation. So Brian, who's from the IIIF uh, Maps, uh, he's a co-chair, I think, who will be hosting the next session, is asking for all the projects, did you find a particular web map platform that worked best for rendering those views? So I know we use Mapbox for, for rendering our map. Yeah, but I, I don't, yeah. there, there certainly isn't a right answer. It, it's, it's whatever works best for the needs of, of your project. Uh, and, and I think um, the biggest dependence is, is where's your data coming from? What's, what's your data source? Is it raster tiles, vector tiles, 3D? Um, and, and kind of figure out your data pipelines first. And then the, the libraries, whether it's Mapbox, MapLibre, uh, Cesium, Leaflet, all, all of that will fall into place once your data library, once your data pipeline is sorted out. Jens, you wanna comment on Cesium or? No, I absolutely agree with uh, David. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, yeah, it, it depends very much, very much on, on the data that you have at hand. And, and very often in many countries, uh, uh, the governments uh, are putting their data uh, uh, to, to uh, they, they open the, the, the data and they, they're using uh, different web services, uh, WMS, vector tiles, and, and so on. And yeah, it depends very much on the data that you have at hand. And then, yeah, uh, you, there are several libraries that, that that you can choose from that that are able to to display the the maps. Yeah. Okay, well, we have three minutes left, so I'll just wait if anyone wants to ask anything before we're done. And just reminding, we have a IIIF map session coming up. So whoever can attend, I strongly encourage you to. So looks like we're through with the questions. So last chance, people. All right. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Josh, do you wanna sure. round up? Yeah, I'll yeah, we'll just close it out. Um, this has been tremendous. And, uh, you know, as has been mentioned, there is kind of a very related session just after this. So if folks want to join that, um, I think some similar discussion there. Um, thank you to all the presenters, Martim, great. MC Martim, uh, excellent <laughs> hosting duties. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I will end the recording here. And then we have a five minute break until the next session, uh, if you want to join the next map session. So thanks all for joining. Um, see you the rest of this week. Thank you so much, everybody. Hopefully you liked it and feel free to contact us. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks Martim for thank sharing you. us. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank, uh, thank you, Martin. Yeah, thank you.